Good evening and welcome to Commencement Eve 2013. What a great crowd here tonight and what a privilege it is for me to welcome all of you to the UMass Lowell Inn and Conference Center for this exciting evening. And before I begin, I'd like to recognize the UMass Lowell Jazz Quartet and our student pianist for providing fabulous entertainment. Thank you. We have a fabulous music department at this institution, and it's reflected every time we have a major event. I also want to acknowledge the student ambassadors. We have a student ambassador program. You see they have the Riverhawk ties. They're dressed beautifully. One of the things we like to do at UMass Lowell is get our students so they're work ready, world ready, and they are work ready. Student ambassadors, thank you very much. Raise your hand. I also want to thank all of the staff at the university who was so involved at planning uh, this event. We appreciate that very much. Now, we are here tonight to celebrate the end of another academic year and to highlight the accomplishments of our talent, uh, talented student award winners as well as the honorary degree recipients. And we had a uh, ceremony earlier with a great discussion with our honorary, was that a great discussion, a great way to get to know our honorary degree recipients. So commencement eve, we, we started it as a celebration of commencement, but um, we also wanted it to be a fundraiser to provide scholarships for our students. And um, the students that are, were getting awards tonight are a clear representation, I think, of the high caliber student talent that we have here at this university. This night, again, has been a great success. I am pleased to announce that thanks in large part to the generosity of all of you in this room, we have raised nearly $725,000 this evening. Another record for this event. That brings our total to nearly $3 million raised in the last six years at this event for student scholarships. And I want to say how much I appreciate our sponsors and our supporters. Now, why do, we, why do we make such a focus of attention on raising money for scholarships? Well, all of us know that it's becoming increasingly more difficult to attend a university. And what's interesting about this, and I know there are members of the Board of Trustees here, and I always like to reinforce this point. If you put in, if you take the University of Massachusetts and you put in inflation, and you look at over the last two or three decades, the cost of an education at the University of Massachusetts when you factor in inflation actually has not increased. In fact, it's slightly gone down if you factor in inflation over the last two or three decades. But what has changed is who pays for it. It's gone basically from about 80% from the state to now at this university about 22% from the state. So that's where the difference has come from. That's why it's so important to raise money for, for scholarships for our students. And I just want to say, we, had, we recognized a number of students earlier. And um, I want to tell you why it's important by acknowledging one student, uh, Rudy Baez. You know, Rudy is a great young man, grew up in, uh, well, moved to Lawrence when he was 12, graduated from Lawrence High School. And Rudy went back to the Dominican Republic, and Ru Ru Rudy figured, you know, I'm not going to go to college. I'll go back to the Dominican. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll figure out what I'm going to do there. But his mother and his grandmother have other ideas. His mother and his grandmother had a dream that Rudy would be the first in his family to graduate from college. So Rudy's in the Dominican. And he starts to feel like he's got to go back to the United States to fulfill the dream of his mother and his grandmother. So he comes back to Lawrence, and he applies for admittance to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And he gets admitted. And he comes to the university. And he's, at the time, he's a commuting student. And uh, he's also working 30 to 35 hours a week. And he's finding it a tough grind because he's working 35 hours a week and he's commuting to the university. And he doesn't do so well in the beginning. In fact, 
Rudy enters his sophomore year, and tragedy hits his life. His mother died in a tragic car accident, and he's devastated. And that year, he's on the verge of flunking out of the university. And as all of us know, that first year, year and a half at a university is critically important. It's one of the reasons why we emphasize student success rates for freshmen and early sophomores. But Rudy got some help from the staff at the university. Led by a number of people were engaged and involved, but one of them who really took the lead with Rudy was Brenda Evans. Is Brenda here? <laughs> Brenda, would you? Oh, there she So Brenda really made it, made it her mission to figure out a way to make sure that Rudy stayed at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And she worked hard with the folks in financial aid. And she found a way to provide some additional financial aid money. And, and Brenda understands what we all understand. If you are here at the university and live here, you have a higher likelihood of academic success. So Brenda said, you've got to come here and live on campus and be part of this university. And we'll find the money. We'll find a way to get financial aid. We'll find a way to make it happen. And Rudy started to excel here. His la five last semesters here, he had better than a 3.0 QM. And he's graduating from this university tomorrow after five successive semesters at a 3.0. Now, <laughs> now, Rudy's mother can't be here to see this dream, but his grandmother is coming out of a nursing home where she's presently living and will be here tomorrow for that commencement. And uh, Rudy, you are everything that this university is about. Would you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> That's why we're raising money for scholarships. We meet about 90% of the financial aid at this institution. And that 10% that we may not meet might be the difference between whether somebody graduates from a college or university or doesn't. I want to recognize a number of our most generous donors who are here joining tonight's celebration. And these are folks that are in the university's circle of distinction. Bob and Donna Manning. John Policino, Mark and Lisa Saab, Jim and Deb Dandino. They don't tell me. They don't tell me what to say in terms of how much money it is, but it's a lot of money, and we appreciate it. Uh, some of you are returning to the campus, or some of you may be visiting for the first time. I want to say welcome. By any measure you'd use to measure a university, we are a university that's headed in the right direction. We have worked hard to reposition this university as a true public enterprise committed to taking an entrepreneurial approach to innovation. And we are more committed than ever to providing the best education to a diverse student population, one that will reflect positive change in this city, in this region, in this community, in this commonwealth, and in this nation. And we would not be able to do that without a great team. And I want to recognize uh, my colleagues who are part of this team. First is ex Executive Vice Chancellor, the first woman to ever have this position at the university, Jackie Maloney. Jackie? <laughs> Our outstanding provost, Ahmed Abdullah. Ahmed. Vice Chancellor for Administration of Finance, Joanne Yastrzemski. <laughs> Vice Chancellor for Advancement, Ed Chu. I'm surprised, Ed, you get that kind of applause after the way you've made everyone give so much money tonight. <laughs> Vice Chancellor for University Relations, Patty McCafferty. I also want to acknowledge uh, the University of Massachusetts trustees who are here and say how much I appreciate the fact that these trustees have taken their time out to be here tonight. When you're a trustee at the University of Massachusetts, trust me, you don't get paid. It's a volunteer mission 
and we are deeply appreciative uh, of their attendance. First, as the chairman of the Board of Trustees, and I want to say uh, Henry Thomas has been engaged uh, with his community in Springfield for a long period of time. And uh, now he's giving back as the chairman of the University of Board of Trustees. And I have to tell you, he was extremely helpful to us in our efforts with Norm Peters to have us go to Division I. He's been very, very good to this university. Please uh, say hello to the chairman of the board, Henry Thomas. Henry, thank you. Another member of the board from Lawrence, a UMass Lowell alum and a former staffer to Congressman Marty Meehan, Zoila Gomez. Zoila. Another trustee that helped us with athletics, Norm Peters. Norm, thanks for being here. We have an outstanding student trustee that we just re-elected. He got elected as a, as a freshman to serve the sophomore year. Now he's going to serve in his junior year. Uh, Phil Jeffrey. Phil? <laughs> Trustee, a great friend of mine for a long period of time. He does an outstanding job for the board, and he's also been great to our university. We had, a, we had a proposal before the Board of Trustees for a doctorate at nursing, and man, he saved us. Trustee Phil Johnston. I don't know if he's here yet, but trustee Ed Collins is also coming, does a great job for us, and we appreciate that. And the <laughs> senior vice president for the University of Massachusetts, Marcy Williams, who has been enormously helpful to us. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce the president of the University of Massachusetts. And since coming to UMass in 2011, he has really placed an emphasis on access affordability for students on research and discovery that are needed to fuel the Commonwealth's innovation economy and on a great capital program that's going to greatly improve our facilities. He's been a great supporter since the time he got here for UMass Lowell. In fact, I'll tell you a little secret because we're only on the UMass Lowell campus. When it was time to s decide, uh, he's a chemistry uh, faculty member, what campus he would have his tenure with, Great judgment. He decided to, to be here at UMass Lowell. Um, he has supported us in our quest to go Division I, largely beca because Bob comes from two systems, uh, one in uh, California and also in Maryland. So he understands fundamentally how top-notch excellence in athletics can improve the uh, academic reputation of an institution. I appreciate his leadership. I appreciate uh, him as a colleague and as a boss. Please welcome. President Bob Corrett. I, I call this time of year at the university the uh, season of celebrations. Uh, it seems like every day, uh, every night, uh, weekend, weekend out, we are having great, great events like this to celebrate what universities are all about, and that's about people and, and making them better. And it's always great being on my favorite campus with my favorite chancellor here at UMass Lowell. <laughs> you know, that designation changes periodically, but uh, <laughs> I find it works best if I'm uh, on my favorite campus whenever I'm on a campus. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I also, I'm going to be a little bit repetitive because uh, I, I do think it's critical that we, we applaud the Board of Trustees. We have a 22-member board, 19 voting members, five of whom are students. Uh, they put in an unbelievable amount of time. They read an unbelievable amount of material. They deal with... A, a, a morass of political issues day to day, uh, and we appreciate uh, all that they do. And having Henry Thomas, our chair here, who's been just great to work with uh, since being appointed chair uh, earlier this year, uh, Phil Johnston, uh, Norm Peters, uh, Ed Collins not here yet, but Ed's, Ed's been great. Uh, it's just uh, in my role, uh, half of my role is keeping the board happy, and the other half is keeping the chancellors in line. It's a uh, it's a pretty, pretty simple job, but the board uh, does a great job, and without them, none of us could do what we need to do. UMass uh, is a nine, nine, uh, uh, I should say nine, three billion dollar business, uh, and, and it's a huge, complex enterprise with about 17,000 employees and 71,000 students and another 60,000 students online. 
and all kinds of pieces to the organization that people don't even know about. Consulting arms that, that, that are, are generating three to $400 million a year in gross income. UMass Online, which is generating $70 million a year in gross income. It's a huge, huge enterprise. And the students are at the core of that, but the rest of the enterprise is critical in order to fund that core. Because as Marty has pointed out, uh, in our lifetimes, uh, state support for public higher education has dropped from roughly 70% of the cost for students down in this state to 43% just on the educational piece, and down, as Marty said, down in the 20s if you take the entire budget. And it's time to turn that around. Uh, politicians will say to me all the time, it's working. All of your campuses have huge numbers of students that are trying to get in. You have no problem attracting them, you have no problem accepting them and them accepting you, and you have no problem getting them through. What's the problem? And the problem is debt. Student debt is larger than credit card debt in this country. Student debt is larger than mortgage debt in this country. Student debt is something that didn't exist when I was an undergraduate. That literally, there were no places for really students to get loans. Their parents could, but the students themselves couldn't. And yet, in you know, three to four decades, we've come to a point where students have a trillion dollars in debt, and that's the only reason the system is still working. So it's critical that we fight to provide the resources to allow students to continue to come in our doors and leave our doors with small amounts or no debt and get the kind of education they need to build the kind of country and commonwealth that we all want. Uh, and we're doing that at the legislative level uh, on Beacon Hill. We're doing that at, at, on the capital level in Washington, trying to make sure that all of the pieces are in place and all of your support with private support is a critical piece of it. It all fits together to make, make the enterprise uh, 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 really the kind of enterprise we all need and all, all, I believe the kind of enterprise we all want. Let me uh, uh, also mention uh, tonight's uh, honorees, the, uh, those getting the uh, honorary uh, doctorates. Uh, I just listened to them speak at, at an event before this one. Uh, they made a, a number of great points. Uh, we have Nancy Donahue, Harish Hande, and Mark and Alicia Saab. Uh, and I'll just mention three things they said that hit home with me because I, things I really believe in. Uh, and I won't say, I won't give them attribution, but one said, uh, follow your dreams, do what turns you on, do what you love doing every day. Uh, another one said, do it now before life overtakes you and you have so many responsibilities you don't have time uh, to do it. Uh, and the, the third one, which I think is critical for all of us, uh, virtually everyone in the room, is that the, the role of faculty is at the core of great universities. We have all bumped into, whether becoming good friends with or just being in a class with a faculty member, a faculty member who has changed our lives. Uh, and that is something that is, is, is just immeasurable and irreplaceable. Uh, and it's something that we need to continue to nurture because it has caused all of us to find paths we may never have found uh, with, without that interaction with that faculty member. Let me say that uh, I'm also pleased always to celebrate our alums and we have uh, with us uh, 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 with us tonight, I believe, Bernie Shapiro uh, is with us. And <laughs> and posthumously, Gary Musica will also, also be given an award. Uh, these, are, these are individuals <laughs> that, again, help transform lives. Uh, universities are the sum total of the people that come through our doors, the faculty, the staff, the students who become alums. And it's what we all accomplish together that sums up to create the kind of university that UMass Lowell, for example, has become. And it's important if you want UMass Lowell to continue to evolve along the path that you're seeing it evolve on today, that we continue to provide that support as faculty, as students, uh, as alums, and as, 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 as comrades in building this great, this great enterprise. Let me end by saying the way I build systems, I've been in systems my whole life. Sometimes systems have a bad name. But the California system has worked very, very well, and I was president out there for nine years. The Maryland system is an extraordinary system, and I was president there for eight years. And Massachusetts is an extraordinary system. And the way you build an extraordinary system is by building extraordinary campuses. I get my clout as the CEO of the system. The board gets to do the kinds of things it wants to do because we have great campuses. If we build great campuses, everything flows from that. And what I try to do is find chancellors that can lead those campuses. That's what the board wants me to do. That's what the board does with me. They pull teams, as Marty has just pointed out, his team that can help lead those campuses. It all comes down to people. People make it happen. And 
As I build UMass in the last two years and as I continue to build it in the years ahead, it's going to be by campus, by campus, by campus, letting each of them achieve the dreams they have for themselves and helping them get there. And I have to say, and this is all honesty, Marty and his team make it the easiest campus to do that with. They're just great to work with. <laughs> They know what needs to get done, both on the input side, great students, great resources, great research, on the output side, great graduates, working with the community to get the kind of political support you need. They've got all the pieces in place on this campus, and you're seeing, in a relatively short number of years under Marty's leadership and the team's leadership here, a transformation of this campus, a transformation that will continue into the months ahead and a transformation that will benefit all of you who are linked to this campus one way or the other. I like to say to the graduates, the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and I'll say this to them tomorrow, is part of your history forever, and you're part of the University of Massachusetts Lowell forever. And it behooves us, therefore, to work together to continue to break, build this great enterprise so that it continues to serve students into the future, and we all benefit, and it gets better and better and better, and who benefits the most? Society as a whole. Thanks for being part of this celebratory <laughs> evening. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, what's, sounds like I'm going to have an easy time with this contract. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure they'll put me through hell. They always do. Keep me in the lower half of chancellors in the country. Where is my wife? Uh, my wife, Ellen, is here, and she sacrifices a lot, and I want her to stand and be recognized, my wife, Ellen. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, a special person who, uh, who did something this week that was really great, but uh, he's the uh, former president of the UMass system who is a faculty member here. He's the interim dean in engineering, and he did a great job all year long with engineering. Um, he, does a great, he has great judgment. He chose me to be chancellor. Uh, very good judgment. But, but Jack has an endowed scholarship for the system as a whole, and this week he committed to a $75,000 scholarship right here at UMass Lowell. Jack, thank you very much for your generosity. Jack. Twenty-one remarkable students were honored early this evening for their outstanding academic, community, and university service and their athletic achievements. And you can read about them in the program, and I think many of you got an opportunity to see them earlier. But at this time, I would li like to ask our student honorees to stand and be recognized. They are the best of what this uh, university puts forward in our, in our outstanding student body, but they are fabulous. We also uh, announced Distinguished Alumni Award uh, recipients uh, for their contribution to the university and their contribution to the public. And uh, we didn't give them um, the clock that we give to the honorees. So, uh, and President Correct mentioned them again, but I, I want to make the presentation of uh, these very, very expensive clocks. Um, we're proud to recognize Bernie Shapiro. Bernie. We also recognized earlier uh, a distinguished alumni posthumously. Um, he uh, was a member of the class of 1971. Gary Musica was uh, an outstanding leader for this university, uh, assistant professor at the Manning, Manning School of Government, director of the graduate program, and he loved athletics. And um, 
Uh, earlier, I got a little emotional thinking about Gary and just how much it meant to him for us to go Division I. So I'd like to ask his wife, uh, Sally, uh, if we could present uh, you with uh, this clock. Sally? We also recognized our honorary degree recipients, and I have to say we were very fortunate to have Associate Professor of English Andre Debus III moderate a conversation with our honorees who discussed their motivation, as the President mentioned, their motivation for giving back, mentors that influenced them, and advice for graduating uh, seniors. And by the way, didn't Andre Debus III do a great job with that? <laughs> I think everybody was there, but. Uh, if you haven't read Towney, you've you got to read Towney. If you grew up in the Merrimack Valley, you just have to, uh, you have to read it. But uh, Andre, thank you very much. Um, now we would like to ask uh, the uh, honorary degree recipients, as I call your name, to come up as we present you with this. Uh, the big ceremony is tomorrow, uh, but we want to present you with this clock. Harish Hyundai. Nancy Donahue. I mentioned earlier, Nancy Donahue, she would call you on the most complex issue in the Congress and she'd tell you exactly what the issue is, how you had to vote and why. And she could also, uh, I lived uh, just a couple of houses down from, uh, uh, from Nancy and, and Dick until my wife made me move to Andover. And, uh, Actually, she's very democratic. It was a, it was a democratic vote. It was one to one. I lost, <laughs> but uh, Nancy's done so much for this community. Nancy, we appreciate that. <laughs> now I see my former favorite neighbor, Phil Donahue's in the crowd, and I haven't seen Philip in a while. And, you know, as soon as I saw him here, I said, uh, Philip, I got to call you up. I have a presentation for you. Come on. <laughs> you saw what happened with our hockey team this year, right? Uh, no. Oh, come on. You saw it. I don't know where it's like swim. Riverhawks, uh, Hockey East. Hockey That's East. for you, buddy. When you said no, you almost didn't get the hat. I want you to know that. <laughs> 1981 graduate of the University of Massachusetts, Lowell, Mark and his wife, Elisa Saab. They, and you know the Emerging Technologies, the Emerging Technologies and Innovation Center is named for Mark and Lisa. And I can, can assure you, it wasn't cheap. All of our uh, 
Honorary de degree recipients have done so much, and we look forward to, uh, uh, to celebrating their careers and their contribution to uh, not only the university and society as a whole, but uh, just remarkable people. And I always felt, uh, before I became chancellor, that oftentimes at the university, folks would get awards or honorary degrees, and the university community never got a real chance to engage and get to know them, and that's one of the reasons why we, uh, we do this event. Uh, there was one honorary degree recipient who wasn't there earlier, earlier, and it's my pleasure now to introduce honorary degree recipient uh, for this year and the commencement speaker for this year's undergraduate commencement uh, speaker, uh, Ed Davis. Now he is. <laughs> now he is. A, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. no uh, he's the uh, 40th police commissioner. He's the 40th police commissioner of the city of Boston, and he oversees the 20th largest law enforcement agency in the country. It's the third largest in New England. And I first got to know Ed Davis a long time ago, I think it was about 23 years ago, when I was appointed uh, first assistant dis district attorney. And I remember going to the little police department, and this guy stood up way up high, and, and that was Ed Davis. And he always had such a great reputation, uh, even back then. And then when I got elected to Congress and I was on the Judiciary Committee, I got very involved as a former prosecutor in community policing in the crime bill. And uh, there was nothing better than having Ed Davis as your police chief in Lowell, who literally set the standard for community policing in America. By focusing on community and preventative policing and new initiatives, he nearly doubled the size of the police force. And he, ha he enjoyed a 60% of the community enjoyed a 60% reduction in major crime. He was literally a national star when he was in Lowell. Since 2006, he has demonstrated that same kind of tenacity in Boston, which has experienced an annual decrease in serious crime. He's nationally recognized for his efforts, both locally but also nationally, including the Police Executive Research Forum, the International Association of Chief Police, uh, police uh, Chief, uh, the Major Cities Chiefs Association. He has brought his expertise to our campus to help students in our criminal justice department integrate with what they have learned in the classroom with his real world experience, collaborating with our faculty on a number of initiatives and providing true experiential advice to our administrators, to our faculty, to our staff, and to students on the complexity of cutting edge policing. Ed is an excellent role model for all of us, but especially our graduates, because he demonstrates how great leaders need top-notch skills, strong character, strong integrity, and the ability to employ both in a time of crisis. Every, you know, being a police chief in an urban area like Lowell or Boston is a tough job. And you really have to have enormous strength and competence, but you need to have integrity. Because if you don't have integrity, if you don't lead by example, if you're not transparent, you can never, ever, ever do a great job running a police department. And you know, Ed displayed those traits in the days immediately following the attack on our nation at the, the Boston Marathon by providing a calming, inspirational, really symbol of strength that all of us needed and he provided it when we all needed it most. I had friends from all around the country that would call me and say, do you know this Boston Police Commissioner? I said, yeah, I know him. Boy, he's really something. I said, you have no idea. We are pleased to award Commissioner Davis with an honorary degree for his decades of exemplary leadership that have benefited the entire Commonwealth and now the entire nation. Because the truth of the matter is, everyone in America now knows how lucky we are to have Ed Davis in Massachusetts. And there was recently, a couple of weeks ago, a piece on 60 Minutes, and I'd like to show it to you. A five-day battle in the war on terror leaves us with a lot of questions. What was the motive for the marathon attack? Where did the terrorists plan to strike next with their arsenal of bombs? And how did the manhunt stop them? in only a little over 100 hours. Tonight, we have the inside story from one of the leaders of that hunt, Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis. Last Monday afternoon, Davis was in the stands at the finish line, 
All was going well, so he left to take a call. One of the city's favorite celebrations was coming to an end. The marathon is always on the day that marks the start of the American Revolution. But suddenly, Ed Davis and a task force of more than 4,000 would find themselves defending Boston on Patriot's Day. When you arrived, what did you see? Something just blew up at the... Run! I saw a uh, bombing incident that I'd only seen in places overseas. I saw Officer Michael Barrett from the Boston Police Department wade into an unbelievable scene of carnage and uh, put the fire out on an individual that was still on fire and then grab belts off people and put tourniquets on the man's legs so he could save his life. This is your city. You're enormously proud of it. And these people had done this on Patriot's Day. It certainly made me resolve to, uh, to, to find these people quickly and to hold them accountable. You were going to get them. Yeah, I was. You made that promise to yourself? I did. And to several other people, too. Very quickly, uh, we established a command post at the Weston Hotel um, in, the, in the ballroom. And that, that expanded from about uh, a dozen people when I first walked in the door uh, to 100 people in, uh, in the first hour. It's a logistical nightmare. Um, we, we found very quickly that we needed uh, a place to process this evidence. Uh, so uh, a warehouse was obtained uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, computers were brought in from the FBI and the state police and, and the Boston police and set up to uh, review video. Among the thousands of faces, they wanted to isolate people who didn't seem surprised. And particularly one of the FBI agents, who was a technical uh, expert, did a tremendous job and, and uh, really was the person that, uh, that was able to get to the bottom of this very quickly. And when you saw the faces of those two men, you thought what? I thought about the death of um, the eight-year-old boy, uh, the Martin child, um, and um, how someone uh, who, who didn't appear to be uh, particularly evil um, could do such an evil thing. They didn't appear all that evil to you? in the video. No, they look like college kids. It was only five or six hours after the videotape was released that events began to unfold rapidly and there right. was a great deal more violence. It's possible that uh, these individuals activated themselves once again uh, because they saw the pictures, because they knew that we would uh, eventually find out who they are. By 10:15 Thursday night, Officer Sean Collier was ambushed and murdered in his cruiser. Then, gunman hijacked a car which was spotted by a lone Watertown officer. At that point, um, the vehicle stopped, and two suspects alighted uh, from um, the, the area of the vehicle and uh, opened fire on the officer. Very quickly, uh, another officer, Officer Richard Dunahue from the MBTA police, uh, arrived at the, uh, at the scene and uh, also engaged in the gun battle. He was shot and grievously wounded. The suspects began to lob devices at the police, and um, the first one was a huge explosion, and then the follow-up explosions were, were, were uh, smaller, but they were improvised hand grenades that were being thrown at the officers. The gun battle uh, continued until one of the suspects uh, ran out of ammunition, and um, one of the uh, sergeants uh, tackled him to the ground. A police officer ran out and tackled him, these men who had armed themselves with so many explosives. That's, that's correct. That's what happened. Uh, it, it probably would not be advised as, as a tactical move, but it shows the courage and commitment that officers have in, in attempting to, uh, to get uh, this thing under control. He was going to put the guy down before he had a chance to reload. Right. And risk his own life to do it. Right. He saw an opportunity and took it. Tamerlan Sarnayev was down, dying from multiple gunshot wounds. The younger brother gets in the car, backs over his older brother, drives away. What happened then? The suspect that, that uh, fled uh, abandoned the vehicle four blocks, four or five blocks away, and uh, took off on foot. We determined that a 20-block perimeter had to be set up. And so began the lockdown of the city of Boston. There was extreme uh, frustration and disappointment um, in the command post. And it was not, what, 30 minutes later? It was probably close to 15 minutes later. That a man yeah. called 911. He went into his backyard where he has a boat with a, a cover over the top, and he saw the cover was torn. Right. He but said he was dying for a cigarette. He had to go outside to have a cigarette. And uh, he saw the blood on the boat, 
And so he peered in uh, after climbing the ladder, and he told me that um, he found he saw a body in there with blood on it. We got movement. He is moving. We have movement in the boat. A gunshot was heard, and officers returned fire. Um, the uh, the order was given to uh, to cease fire. Uh, we then pulled the the, uh, the state police helicopter in, which has a uh, a flow, forward looking infrared device on its nose, and it was able to come in and um, and actually look through the plastic on the boat and uh, and see the suspect inside. Do you think he's going to pull through? I, I wouldn't comment. But the wounds are serious enough that there's a chance that he might not. They're very serious wounds. On Saturday at Fenway. The Red Sox honored the innocent people who were lost and wounded and the army of 4,000 who were part of the investigation. In Boston, of course, this is a great honor. The Red Sox are the second oldest sporting institution in the city after the Boston Marathon. Please welcome 2013 honorary degree recipient and our commencement speaker, Boston Police Commissioner Edward S. Davis III. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. People have been so kind over the last several weeks. Uh, and I accept that applause on behalf of the, uh, the officers, uh, the men and women of the Boston Police Department, uh, the fire department, EMS, uh, the medical people, ev everybody that, uh, that responded to this uh, terrible situation. Um, I'd like to say thank you to UMass President Robert Carrett, UMass Board of Trustees Chairman Henry Thomas III, and other trustees, honored guests, friends, and colleagues. Um, thank you, Marty, for, uh, for showing uh, that 60 minutes piece, because uh, you might not believe this, but I have not seen it <laughs> yet. I really didn't. Uh, uh, so I did get a call from my friend Ken LaValle, who uh, I don't know if he's out here or not tonight, but Ken, uh, hey Ken, how are you? <laughs> Ken, I, I, I appreciate the fact that when you called, you said I had a big head. Uh, <laughs> and, and now I know why. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I want to say that Scott Pelley's shot was a lot less close than mine. They, they were zooming in on me. So anyway, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be back in Lowell and to, to see old friends. I see Nancy Donahue. Congratulations on your, uh, your well-deserved degree and Dick and Philip and, um, and some of the other people. John Chumley came over and uh, there's, there's quite a crew here of my old friends and colleagues. And it's good to be back in the city. Uh, it's, um, it's uh, inter interesting, too. I, I had a, a brief uh, conversation with Rob before I came up here, and we talked about how lucky Lowell is to have Marty Meehan as the head of this uh, venerable institution that has played such a big role in the lives of anyone who comes from this area. And um, we are lucky. But I get some insight into why he's here, um, and, and, and Lowell has been so lucky to have him back. I visited Congress this past week. and. <laughs> And, and I think the dysfunction there has been to our benefit because uh, I can see why Marty would want to come back here after being down there. Um, so I, I, he's asked me to speak a little bit about what happened, and I'll, I'm going to run through some, some facts about what occurred uh, to us in Boston, uh, what, what uh, challenges uh, over, we overcame and, and uh, faced in, in this, uh, in this uh, crazy uh, week that we spent uh, four or five days uh, chasing these guys. Um, but also some of the things that worked really well and, and some of the reasons why uh, we were prepared to, to deal with this uh, unthinkable tragedy. Um, April 15th is a big day in the city and uh, I've been to every marathon and uh, since, I, since I've been the police commissioner. And um, it's, it's, it's a big day for us because a lot of preparation goes into it. We know it's an international event. We know there's international media there. We know that it's a soft target. And we know that since 9-11, the threat of terrorism exists. So we spend a lot of time preparing for it. We work with our partners at the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. Uh, we get intelligence streams coming in from all the intelligence agencies that come into our Boston Regional Intelligence Center. We spend a lot of time working with the state police, with the National Guard, and with other police agencies 
who are partners, like the uh, transit police. And they're all activated on that day. Um, we have over 800 police officers just from Boston assigned to this event. And that's just for the area from the Boston city line in. Uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of other uh, police agents, uh, police and federal agents, and, um, and, st and state troopers, and uh, just about everybody you can, you can think of uh, get together about this, plan for it, put a threat assessment out on it, and uh, try, to, try to prevent any kind of a, of a problem. Uh, tragically, this year, we were not able to prevent it. Um, as, as, uh, as was said in the piece, uh, I was at the finish line with my wife and uh, four of my buddy's uh, kids who wanted to come down to see the, uh, the race from Maine. And um, my wife and I left, and we left the four kids in the, in the stands. Uh, they're all young adults, but uh, uh, as you can imagine, when I found out that this thing happened and, and I was heading back to, uh, to get to the scene, uh, my, my concern was with uh, those, those kids. Luckily, they had left just a couple of minutes before the bombs went off. Um, I finished up the phone call I was on, and the phone immediately rang just as I hung up on, on the call from Washington. And um, it was my chief of department, and he said, Commissioner, I don't know what we've got here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm heading back to the scene. Danny had, had been at the finish line, and he, every year he walks the route uh, all the way out to the city limit. So things had, uh, all the elite runners had passed, uh, the threat uh, of, of, of uh, attacking those elite runners was over because they had all fled, left the scene. The governor had come and put the laurel wreath on the runners and, and he had left. And so uh, we felt that, uh, that we were over the hump on this one. Um, and, and, and one of the things that still puzzles us as to why they didn't hit when all that international media was there. If you look at that, uh, that uh, bridge that goes up over the finish line. There are hundreds and hundreds of photographers and videographers there that are covering the, the elite runners. And for some reason, um, ter you know, terrorists, of course, will, will try to get the widest audience possible. So all of our preparations are around the times when that would be most likely to happen. But e either, either they, they figured this out and they waited, or they just didn't get their act together when they came in late. But for whatever reason, um, some time, hours actually, into the, into the finish uh, was when this incident occurred. The chief said to me, uh, we've got bombs that went off. He said we had explosions, two explosions. And he said, I don't think they're electrical. And I knew what he meant because we had just had a large electrical explosion down there less than a year ago. And I said, well, tell me what you've got. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm heading to it back to the finish line from Kenmore Square. He said, Danny Kilo, one of our sergeants, is uh, yelling on the radio, asking for every ambulance in the city. And he's saying that he's got two explosions. And, um, and so I'm, I'm on my way to find out what happened. I said, what else did Danny say? He said, um, Commissioner, he's talking about amputations, multiple amputations. And so when I heard that, I, um, I immediately felt that this was most likely an IED. Um, the, the training that I've had, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in, in the future, uh, would indicate that that's what we were dealing with. And so working on that premise, that shot report, it, it just the second, uh, it actually literally as the officers were still running towards the, uh, towards the incident, um, I was on the phone with the FBI. I called Rick Delorier who was my counterpart, the SAC, special agent in charge of the Boston office. Rick and I are friends. We have each other's phone numbers. I said to him, Rick, I don't know what I've got here, but I've, uh, I've got two explosions. And we all know, anybody who's been trained in this, that if it's Al-Qaeda, they hit three times. And so I said, we're going to need all of your assets, all of your SWAT assets, all of your EOD assets. Have them meet, meet us at Ring Road uh, uh, in, in downtown Boston. Uh, he said, we're on the way. He was actually in the office. I then got Timmy Alban on, on the phone, and I said the same thing to him. T Timmy is the colonel of the state police, and he's got SWAT assets, and he's got EOD teams. And I had them all rolling to the scene within five minutes of the initial report. When I first got to the scene, uh, I witnessed uh, a, a, a terrible scene, uh, something that you, uh, you hope you'll never see. Um, the first blast uh, happened at the, uh, at the finish line. 
And that particular device appeared to be stronger than the, than the uh, second blast. Um, the blast went up 30 to 40 feet. I surveyed, sur surveyed the damage. Um, there was still a significant amount of, uh, of um, shrapnel that was on the ground uh, that had uh, emanated from the bomb. If you've done any studies in this, uh, it's easy to see and easy to, to recognize that this is an anti-personnel device. Um, I then went to the Forum restaurant, and at the Forum restaurant uh, at the end of Ring Road at Boylston, there, was, uh, there were two bodies, uh, uh, Martin Richard and uh, Lee Lingsey, uh, the, the uh, young lady that was, uh, that was killed, the BU student. They were still on the scene. Uh, there were also uh, four patrol wagons that were uh, being loaded up with, uh, with patients. Um, all of our ambulance had been, ambulances had been exhausted with the uh, patients that were there. The, the cops were chasing ambulances down, and the ambulances were saying, we're full, we're full, and driving by the cops. And they still had people with, uh, with tourniquets on their legs lying on the ground. Uh, so uh, my chief, uh, Danny Linsky, gave the order before I got there to, uh, to put them in patrol wagons. So police wagons were pulling up, and there were two patients and, and EMTs being stuck inside the, the wagon and, and driven away. We cleared all the patients from the scene in 22 minutes. A remarkable, uh, a remarkable, uh, thank you. Thank you. A, a remarkable feat that was made uh, possible by the, uh, by the large number of medical personnel that were in the tents at the end of the race. They, they all ran up and relieved uh, the first responders uh, from doing the first aid. And one of, the, one of the things that's really remarkable and something that we're most proud of is that no one who, who was uh, removed from that scene died. We had 17 critically injured patients that were removed from that scene, some of them in patrol wagons, and despite that, um, everybody that hit the hospital uh, survived. Uh, one of the, uh, thank you, thanks. That's a, that's a testament to, to, the, uh, to the medical care that is available here in, in the city of Boston and a, uh, an incredible uh, statement about, uh, about the, uh, the medical team that, uh, that received these devastating injuries. Uh, the shrapnel uh, tore flesh and, and uh, muscle from bones and, uh, and severed legs and arms and uh, it was just a terrible, terrible thing. I visited quite a few of the, uh, of the patients uh, since, I've, uh, since, since the incident happened. And it's incredible to see their, uh, their you know, forcefulness and their, uh, their sort of uh, desire to, uh, to, to carry on, as, as the Brits would say. Uh, at one point in time, there were 100 surgeries being done in the city. 100, 100 operating rooms were operating at the same time in the city, city of Boston. So um, obviously a terrible, terrible situation. But very quickly, some things came to, came to our attention. Um, it was very important for us to recover videotape, and we knew that immediately. It was the first thing that we ordered. Within 10 minutes of the bomb going off, there were teams of officers already accessing videotape at the various uh, establishments up and down the parade, the, uh, the race route. Um, <coughs> tragically, uh, Crystal Campbell perished at the, uh, at the finish line. Um, and, and as I said, 12 seconds later, the second bomb in front of the forum went off and Martin Richard and Lou Lingsy died. Nearly 300 were injured. Uh, the, nation, uh, the nature and the duration of this horrific event tested everything we'd learned about leadership during critical incidents. Uh, establishing commands. I talked about the command post that we established at the Weston Hotel. Um, that was really critical in coordinating the response. The National Guard had a small presence at this event. They had about 150 troops. By the end of that evening, there were 1,500 National Guardsmen on the streets of Boston. Uh, we had uh, the largest crime scene that we ever had to lock down. Uh, we also had a, had a situation where, uh, expecting that there would be a third blast, um, and looking at the scene, I, I, you know, it, it was striking how, how, how that scene had changed in just an hour. Uh, an hour ago, I was there, there were, there were tens, maybe 100,000 people just in that, uh, in that area at the end of Boylston Street. And, uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a joyous occasion. Everyone was having a good time. When I got there 15 minutes after the blast, there were no visitors, no, no, no civilians left on the scene. Um, there was um, the scene of carnage with, uh, with, with uh, bodies and, and, and other terrible things. Uh, the most blood I've ever seen at any, at any event 
any, any, and I've been in this business for 32 years. I, this is not something that you see in regular policing, what we witnessed that day. Um, but there was also a strange feeling to the street because there was paper and things that had been dropped on the street and it was windy and they were blowing around. It was almost like, uh, like tumbleweeds in a, in a deserted city. There, there was nobody on scene but uniformed police officers. And, um, and so we, we made decisions quickly. One was get our uniform cops back, establish a perimeter, and lock this area down so the uh, uh, EOD, the bomb squad, can go through all these packages. There were, there were literally hundreds of backpacks and packages and, and pocketbooks that were dropped by people who were running away. And that presented a major challenge for us. I, I grabbed Chris Conley, who's a sergeant in charge of our bomb squad. And, um, you know, we lost an officer, Jerry Hurley, back in the uh, 1980s uh, in a bombing incident that occurred. He went up on a package, uh, uh, started to move it, and it was set off and killed him. And so, it's, so, so these guys get a lot of calls. They get very few actual bombs, but it does happen, and they're very good at what they do. They've all been trained by the Israeli military uh, and, and by the American military in how to do what they do. And the Israelis developed a process called cut and tag. Uh, when you have a lot of packages in a scene like this, uh, you go up with a very sharp knife and you start to slice open the bag on the side so that you don't trigger uh, any device uh, by opening up uh, the top of it. But if it is a device, it's a very, very dangerous thing to be doing. And um, Chris had just done a dozen of those, and he was putting his bomb gear on. And I remember being struck by um, he, what he was being asked to do. You know, um, these guys do this all the time, but this was overwhelming. This was a, a battle scene, and he, he was being sent into it. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, you know, very, it was a, a, a big moment for me in understanding the, the enormity of what we were taking on. Um, you know, I'm going to talk tomorrow at the graduation about a, con a continuing uh, s sense of a life learning experience. And, and so, Everything that I had learned up to that point here in Lowell, working in the narcotics unit, doing drug raids, and running around with, with Kenny and, and Billy Taylor and uh, Frank Waterman and, and all those guys, uh, you know, fighting drug wars back in the 80s and 90s, um, and, and, and the various operations that we've done here in the city, all of that experience comes into play when you end up in a situation like this. And, um, and so there was. Um, there was all of that. Um, I knew that we needed video. I knew that we needed to clear the packages. I knew that we needed command and control. Um, and we had some challenges. The, uh, uh, the establishment of the command post worked pr perfectly, flawlessly, and everybody came there. Uh, we had to set up security on, on the command post because we had hundreds of reporters and, and uh, uh, Every, every news outlet in the nation began to dispatch people to Boston when this happened, uh, controlling them, uh, keeping them in a place where we could access them when we needed to talk to them, but also where they wouldn't be in the way of, uh, of the operation was critically important. Um, the cell phones broke down almost immediately. Uh, just like in 9-11, uh, we had absolutely no cell service anywhere in the city. Um, and, and the reason for that was volume. No, no one, there was a rumor around that the police had shut the cell phones down for some reason. <laughs> I don't even know how to do that, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that didn't happen. But, uh, but anyway, uh, we couldn't talk to anyone. Uh, so our only means of communication were our portable radios and landlines. So the Western Hotel was kind enough to get one landline into the room and there was a raft of federal and state agents standing in line trying to report back to their bosses to this one telephone. We went back to the 1960s, actually, uh, in, in communications. Uh, but we were able to talk to our offices on the street. And we established a good perimeter that went for about 25 blocks. Uh, and, and, and the businesses uh, were, were very cooperative in getting people out of there. First of all, the businesses on Boylston Street had let people shelter inside their business. And then as, uh, as things started to calm down, we were able to get the back doors open into the alleys, and they were able to go out without coming back into the dangerous, the hot zone that was, that was out front. Uh, everybody, everybody worked very well with us. The crime scene was started and, um, and, and went for uh, seven days. Um, the, uh, 
um, the investigation started right that very minute and continued aggressively uh, for the next uh, 48 hours. And uh, as I said in this piece, uh, we set up a special uh, location in a uh, warehouse, that, an undisclosed location, uh, that we set up with uh, federal and uh, state and local agents. Um, uh, that one side of it was for evidence processing. We had so much evidence that we had to bring it into a warehouse uh, just like they do in a plane crash. It was set up in that, in that way. Uh, the other half of the warehouse was dedicated to processing video and, uh, and uh, still picture evidence that was sent in by, by, the, by the truckload, literally, from the public. Everybody cooperated when we asked for this. It made an enormous difference in our ability to solve this, uh, this incident. Uh, we made the decision after a lot of debate to put the, uh, to put the uh, photos of the suspects out there. Uh, we had to. Uh, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, two guys uh, that we knew uh, were intent on killing people, and we did not have them in hand. We did not have them under surveillance, and we needed the public's help in solving this crime. We also owed it to the public. There were Bruins games happening. There were Red Sox games happening. I argued strong and, and loud about our, our responsibility to get this information out to the public so that uh, we wouldn't have a second incident. And ultimately on uh, Thursday, we had the press conference. Um, it's my belief that, as I said in the, in the piece here, uh, uh, it's my belief that that's what caused them to activate themselves. I believe that, that, they, uh, that they thought they could get away with this, believe it or not and that they had gone back to make other bombs, as we know, because they threw them at us. Um, tragically, they saw Sean Collier sitting on the side of the street uh, up by Memorial Drive. Uh, they swung the car around, walked up behind him, and ambushed him, shot him in the head, killed him. And um, they tried to get his gun out of his holster, and uh, they weren't able to do that. They tried for a little over two minutes, we know. Uh, they then fled the scene. Uh, they then kidnapped a young man named Danny in a car, uh, carjacked him, took him for a short ride, and then uh, he was able to escape on Memorial Drive at the uh, mobile station. He went there for refuge. And it was a good thing that he did because he would not have survived that if he hadn't got away. Um, as soon as we got the information that this incident had happened, uh, we felt that it was tied into the Collier homicide and uh, although no one could say definitively that these were the suspects in the bombing, we were highly suspicious of the activity. So we started to dispatch officers into Cambridge. Um, we had them at the, uh, Collier, at the Collier homicide scene. Uh, and as they were there, information started to come in on the whereabouts of the car through some technical in, uh, information that, that we were able to access. And a Watertown officer spotted the car. And, uh, I talked to him, uh, I, I, the, the, the shootout started, and uh, I got the call uh, again from the chief who said, um, Commissioner, we're in a shootout with, uh, with these guys and they're throwing bombs at us. And, and I said, what? <laughs> he said, I'm telling you, they're throwing bombs at us. So I, I, jumped, I jumped up, I was, I was actually, I tried to go to sleep. It was about uh, 12 o'clock at night and I was trying to get some sleep. And, uh, I jumped out of bed and um, I, I grabbed uh, my keys and I realized that I had left my gun at, at the office. So I said to my wife, Jane, I, I, I don't have my gun. It, 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 my son's a police officer. Does Eddie have a gun? <laughs> and, and Jane said, I think he does. I said, well, go up and get it. I, I need it. <laughs> so my poor wife ran upstairs and got my gun and, and I, I went out because there was literally a running gun battle going on at that particular time. These are not things that American police get involved in. These are very, very unique and strange situations uh, and tragic situations because um, uh, Officer Donahue, Dick Donahue, by the way, uh, which was ironic to me when I first heard the name, um, he, uh, he, he did a heroic job in getting in involved in this uh, incredible uh, shooting incident that occurred where the suspects were loading and reloading guns and firing and, and uh, throwing, throwing uh, improvised explosive devices at the officers. Um, you all know what happened. Um, I, I don't have to belabor the point. We, we, uh, 
we set up that 20 block perimeter. It was key to the whole, uh, to the whole event. Uh, and even though at the end of the day we thought that we had missed them, uh, within a half hour of lifting that, uh, of lifting that, uh, the, and the poor guy with the cigarette, I went in to see him. I was there when, you know, when they were shooting at this guy. And uh, I went in to see the guy with the cigarette, and he, uh, he said, my wife won't let me smoke in the house, and I was going crazy. And, <laughs> and, and uh, it, was, it, was remar it was really remarkable. He, he did such an incredible job in, in letting us know that that guy was there, and they were on top of him very, very quickly. Um, we asked people to shelter in place. They, they listened to us. Even that guy, it listened to us. He didn't even go out in his yard to have a cigarette. He just stayed in the house, when, which I thought was remarkable. Um, there were 26.2 miles um, that expands to 55 miles uh, of a perimeter when you look at that whole race. You cannot lock that. We do not have enough police officers in Massachusetts to lock down a 55 mile perimeter. Can't be done. These are soft targets. Um, we, we learned that we needed to rotate personnel. Uh, at, the, at the scene of the arrest, I had been up for 40 hours. Um, when, I was, when I was doing those interviews with the cameras, I really didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> anything, anything could have come out of my mouth at that particular time. I, I managed to get through it. We had a presidential visit on Thursday, and, and uh, President Obama uh, was incredible. He came here to the city to, uh, to console us, and we needed that. Um, and um, and it, was, uh, it, was a, it was an incredible moment when he went to the cathedral and, uh, and said what he said about the city of Boston. But he was also good to his word. Within an hour of the incident happening, I was on the telephone with Bob Mueller, the FBI director, and with Eric Holder, the attorney general. Um, the president called the mayor and told the mayor that any asset of the federal government was his. And I will tell you that as we locked down those neighborhoods in Watertown, uh, and we needed things, we got them immediately. We got tanks, uh, armored personnel carriers from the, uh, from the military. We got, um, we had uh, a lead that the suspects were in Dartmouth and we needed to get our SWAT teams to Dartmouth. Uh, within 15 minutes, they landed three Black Hawk helicopters to pick up our SWAT teams and transport them to Dartmouth. Uh, literally, uh, everything that the federal government, state government, local government could do, we did to find these guys. And, um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, we were able to run them down. A um, few things helped. The communication systems that we have, prior existing relationships with the federal, state, and local officers who all know each other, extensive critical incident training that included Operation Urban Shield, which is funded by the Department of Homeland Security. That forced us to think the unthinkable. It made me think that well, if something like this ever happened to me, I would have to call Rick DeLore and I would have to call Tim Albans. It also helped the medical personnel because they looked at uh, major events like that and how to deal with them. Um, I, I also did a lot of travel overseas, some of it when I was here in Lowell, although I don't think the city manager knew at the time. <laughs> but, but that statute is run, so I could, yeah, exactly. Um, so um, I went to, uh, I went to uh, London in 2005 after the tube, tube bombings, and I met with Ian Blair, who was a commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police, and he brought out a bomb, a backpack bomb. Uh, they had rebuilt it. He put it on the, on the conference table. And he let us all look at it and see how it worked. He also brought in the video that was so important to them solving that case. And those things that I learned from Ian Blair helped the, 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 the visits that I made to Israel and, and Jordan this past summer, talking to people who have dealt with terrorism in a very real way, helped. All of these things came together. And, and, and the, other, the other story that, that I don't have time to get into here is the importance of social media. Um, we were able to correct mistakes that the, that the, that the media made through our uh, Twitter and Facebook accounts. Uh, the story about the Saudi national that had been arrested was not true. There was a suspect, we looked at him, we discounted him within the first 12 hours. But a, but a, but a persistent rumor existed. Uh, some people on social media started to look at photos in the crowd and picked out two innocent young men who just happened to be there for no reason, for, for no reason but to enjoy the marathon. And they had their pictures posted all over the internet and on the front page of the New York Post saying that they were the suspects in the bombing. I suspect that the Post will have some problems with that down the road. And, and that's true. And that's, that's appropriate. But finally, I just want to say one thing. Um, 
everybody that I talk to, uh, the, the, the new word with the policy people in Washington is, well, what is the narrative on this? It's like the narrative is what thinking out of the box was to the 1980s. Now it's the narrative. Everybody wants to know what the narrative is, right? And, and, and there's one thing that shines through here as the important point from my perspective. The, the Chancellor spoke about, about my commitment to community policing. We chased these guys down because the public saw their picture. We caught this guy because the public saw the picture. We, um, we worked closely with the public. And incredible things happened within that blast zone. That blast happened, and within a half an hour, men with, sh with rifles walked into the uh, lobby of the Lenox Hotel and told the manager that his hotel was closed and his guests would have to leave. And then they took over the hotel. The manager was very kind and opened the place up to us. Within one day, that place had no guests. It was top to bottom, federal agents, Boston police, and Mass State, <coughs> Mass State police. We had every boardroom inside the place. Every, uh, every congregation room that we could get was put into processing evidence and doing what needed to be done in this investigation. It became our command post on the ground for the operational personnel. Um, the staff were all told to go home. But they came back of their own accord because the cops needed to be fed. So they started to feed the cops. The hotel went out and got food from other hotels and brought it in. When they ran out of their own food, they started bringing food in to feed the officers there, three square meals a day for the first 48 hours. For no, no talk about pay for it, just they did it. As I said, the, the staff started to come back and volunteer their time. And so the federal agents and the cops started to feel bad. They realized that the, that the staff wasn't being, wasn't being paid. So they started to leave tip, tips, big tips. Now, the cops don't usually do that. <laughs> it's a big deal. But they, they did it. And, uh, and the story that, that really does exemplify the, the, the way that people acted in the city of Boston ends like this. Those kids who got those tips, collected them, and turned them into the, uh, to the one fund. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> of, of, uh, of all the things I saw down there, that's the thing that breaks me up. I don't know why. But anyway, uh, it's, it, sh it shows what Boston is all about. It shows that, that, this, that this term, Boston Strong, is, is, is in embedded in a feeling of, um, of cooperation and support among the residents and the businesses of that city uh, because this is a real community. And it plays itself out right here in this room. The people who come here and who support this university have that same uh, foresight and commitment to the community. So I applaud you all. Thank you. What an example for our students graduating tomorrow. You know, another graduating student who uh, is here with us tonight who wanted to meet our commencement speaker is Jimmy Walker. Jimmy is a business administration student from Tingsboro, and he is a survivor. He has fought through three brain surgery as a result of two bouts with bacterial meningitis prior to transferring to Mass Lowell. He's a runner. And intramural sports has always been important to him. Jimmy has used sports to stay strong in the aftermath of his illness and surgeries. And last month, after training for just three days, he finished the Boston Marathon just moments before the first of the two explosions. Jimmy credits the first responders, including the Boston police, with delivering him and his family to safety. He wanted an uh, opportunity to meet Commissioner Davis tonight, never to be one to be turned. Jimmy plans to run in the Boston Marathon next year. Tomorrow, he will learn a bachelor's degree in business administration. Congratulations, Jimmy, and I have to present uh, Ed Davis with a clock, but I thought Jimmy should do it. Jimmy?
You know, his time was 319. Man. Um, thank you very much to Ed. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we're going to open up the food stations and uh, open up the bar and enjoy uh, the evening. Thank you very much for being here. This has been a great night for the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Thanks very much.